because it has become more complex than anyone ever intended. And complexity is itself a form of corruption because it creates barriers to entry. So despite being transparent, in other words, transparency is not necessarily an indication of a lack of corruption. It could be, you could have the most transparent society possible, but if you have to analyze or be an expert you know, on three different levels of, of government code, federal, state, national, uh, sorry, federal, state, and local, in order to get something done properly without, the, without being at risk for a fine, in that case, <laughs> you, you might as well have, you can see how a religious system that purports to be based on morality, that is, that has a respected elder in the community making decisions for you, you can see how that wizened man can create a better system overall, locally, if that person has credibility. You can also see why the mafia can also be more credible within different communities that are not able to enforce contracts efficiently. And so you can see this idea that if the law that was supposed to replace the church in the West, if it had been successful, the mafia would not exist. And the mere fact that the mafia does control so much economic activity is based on, number one, the debt being used by the, by the banking system's majority, inefficiently and ineffectively, which then paves the way for other sources to come in and provide a more efficient system that is outside the bounds of the law. And whether you call this the wizened old man in the village that everyone respects, or whether you call this rule of law by Mafia Don, the idea is that it all stems from a failure of civil institutions run by the majority that were supposed to become better than what came before them. So, in this case, in the West, the law has failed simply because it may have started out as simple, but over time, it become, became more and more complex. And you can see this in a couple of ways. Let's take a very simple example. Uh, the Ten Commandments, we started off with thou shalt not kill. Well, what about self-defense? Okay, we have to add on something regarding self-defense. Most people realize that there are exceptions to every rule. One of them would be self-defense, but let's make it more, so we have that. But what happens if somebody now has a, is building a bomb in a house in your neighborhood? What do you do at that point? Well, you probably have to have a, you can't arrest a person for, for what he might do, because you do have, he's not violating that original law, which he's not violating thou shall not kill. So suddenly you have a system in place that probably will permit some kind of surveillance or you know, something that allows you to maintain the, the, pre the pretense of law, but that actually expands the power of the executive branch and its discretion over time. Because that's, that law, that's the simple law doesn't work when technology and complexity and diversity increases over time. And we all know this, we've known this for a long time. 300 years ago, about, or 250 years ago, the motto of one of the universities, the Protestant universities on the, on the East Coast, was laws without morals are useless. So we've known this for a long time, that a law is really inferior unless it seeks to re become a better replacement for fairness and justice as contemplated by the anti-Catholic French Revolution in Europe. And so, you then see the idea behind, now you have to have a system in place that is able to, to account for all contingencies, but whatever law you come up with, you can also see that it gives tremendous discretion to the executive branch 
whether the military or the police. And in doing so, creates a gap between the idealism of the law and the reality of enforcement. And what I'm getting at with all this in a very meandering way is that nothing has changed since the 1950s. There's been no progress made in these systems since the 1950s at all. So we've basically wasted 70 years. And so if you're young and you're wondering what the heck happened, the answer to your question is, we tried and we failed completely for 70 years. And I'll tell you why, I'll prove this to you. In 1950s, you had a revolution. Well, actually, you have multiple revolutions all, all over the world. So the first thing you have to understand is that World War II in 1945 did not end conflicts. It simply regressed conflicts into a guerrilla warfare state or through proxy wars. And Cambodia is, an, is a very simple example of this. You have a country that was, was caught in between superpowers and, and it was supposed to be neutral, but because it didn't, didn't really have oil, didn't have natural resources, it wasn't a port, and it couldn't compete with Singapore or Singapore's port, you had a system in place where the country is then bombed by the Americans, invaded by the Vietnamese, and then also invaded by or occupied, not only invaded, but occupied by the Vietnamese, and then at some point becomes this proxy war, this proxy battleground against the Soviet Union to try to test how far the Soviets were willing to expand their promises of protection, which in this case failed because they had to go through American territory as well as Chinese territory. And suddenly you realize that when you have these systems in place, diplomacy fails, has failed, because the whole point of diplomacy is that post-World War II, smaller countries could be free from coercion by larger, more powerful ones. And you saw that in China you had this revolution, this peasant-based revolution against the concentration of wealth, which at that time is not stocks or bonds, it's land, right? You had a peasant-based revolution against landlords, which wiped out the elites in China. And you still have this going on a decade, two decades later, later in, in a separate country under the Khmer Rouge. So right away you see that the legal system that was supposed to be more beneficial, more fair, failed leading to a concentration of, of property ownership in China, which then led to a peasant-based revolution. That was the same thing that happened in France, except that we didn't call those people landlords, they called them Catholics, which of course also overlaps with real estate because the Catholic Church is one of the, one of the largest real estate owners in the whole world. So you have this proxy as well for concentration of ownership, especially real estate, that you can now see is linked in part to political stability and debt that allows you to purchase and develop, especially real estate, and then concentrate that ownership through economic cycles. This also happens in oil and gas. In a lot of the oil fields and gas fields in Canada are owned by the, by the United States. Why? When there was an oil bust, the United States went up there and bought all the leases. And it was able to do so because of a similar legal system, a similar language, and so on. If you don't have that, you can see how it becomes far more complicated to go into a country like Cambodia and try to develop it. Which of course tells you right away that there's more to development than simply a banking system and a law. Because if, if that was all there was to it, if there were no political angles involved, then Cambodia would be far more developed than it is today. But it's not. That tells you a lot of other things. But let's get back to the law. So you have a system that's supposed to create fairness, and it hasn't obviously, obviously hasn't done so. 
am who hasn't done so because in part, nothing has changed in 70 years. And we know this because nothing ended in 1945, it continued. And we know this because of Vietnam and the conflicts in Vietnam that spilled over all over the world where countries were not secure in the idea of an international tribunal protecting them and had to sign defense pacts with powerful countries. In this case, Vietnam with the Soviet Union. And in this case, Cambodia attempting to align itself with the United States, which failed. The United States installed its, its preferred political person, I think it was Lal Nan. That person was overthrown by forces backed by another superpower, that, which then led to bombing. More bombing happened in Cambodia in terms of tonnage than in Japan by the United States. Regardless, you have a situation now where if the law worked, whether domestically or internationally, there wouldn't be this concentration of power, especially in real estate. And there wouldn't be this need for Vietnam <laughs> or Cambodia to sign on these defense pacts. The only reason that you would need these things is, is if the post-World War II system failed in a similar, though not, though not as egregious fashion, as the League of Nations post-World War I. And so the first thing you have to understand if you're trying to analyze this period and his period in history is that everyone has failed in the West, a total failure of, dipo of diplomacy post-World War II, which then led to low-grade conflicts all the way up, all over the world, that exist, that continue to exist today. But because we, we, study, we study these events separately, we study 9-11 separately from the funding of the Taliban by the United States, in Afghanistan in order to collapse and overextend the Soviet Union. We study Vietnam separately from the Chinese Revolution. We study Cambodia separately from the peasant-based revolution in China and other places against the landlords. We study American history separately from the European revolutions. We study it to the point where most Americans don't know that the reason that the word, the term for African American used to be Negro, they don't know that that's because the southern part of the, of the, of the U.S. was controlled, was colonized by Catholic Spain. And the word for black in Spanish and Portuguese is Negro, Negro. So if you understand these things, you, you can sort of work your way backwards. Now, the law becomes too complicated. What result does that have for you and me today? What you see is, is that the lack of progress has been because not only diplomacy has failed internationally and domestically, but also because the failure to create a properly functioning system of laws that include morality and inclusion within a cost of, and, and cost-effective access we can see that it has resulted in the laws becoming more complex, which then causes the people in power, we'll call them liberals or progressives, to expand the law even more to make up for the people who are not included. Rather than fixing the underlying economic issues, which result from political failures relating to the banking system, not the law. And so, you see how studying history, historical events separately, makes you ignorant of context. You can also see how studying law separate from economic development also makes you ignorant in terms of context. And so suddenly we're speaking about things like affirmative action, which was an attempt to incorporate, fix this redlining issue that prohibited wealth creation for certain members of society African Americans within the US, but without actually fixing the banking system's inherent issues relating to making loans to people that over time 
will legitimately show that would legitimately show data that would lead to a higher interest rate, not based on a legal prohibition, but based on data such as savings that were impacted by all these other historical decisions previously. And, and instead of fixing that, what happened was the progressives in this case decided, this is just one example, that we're going to pass a lo another law, making things more complex, giving preferences in order to fix what was really an economic issue. Fast forward to, now that, that causes problems because now you have a conservative backlash and you have op opportunities where every four years, if you try to make a law on the progressive side that is inclusive, but that's, that but does not actually fix the underlying problem because it's trying to fix something only within its own branch. And in other words, lawyers are trying to fix something that's within its own branch without collaborating with the executive branch, which is also tied into, tied into the banking sector. And because it's trying to fix something only within its own branch, it's not able to get anything done. It's a show. And what happens is over time, nothing gets done. You're back to square one. And furthermore, every four years, somebody comes in and shows a specific result that is unfair as a result of this more inclusive policy that you've tried to create. For example, simply the idea that a, uh, in the back case, which was the famous case that allowed affirmative action, where I believe a law school was able to admit someone who was a person of color over somebody that was uh, extremely qualified. I'm talking, uh, I didn't realize this at the time, but apparently uh, the person was a military veteran that scored, I think, in the top 10% on every test, on the LSAT and so on. And that person was rejected from the law school in favor of somebody that had much lower scores. And you can actually see how that, that case might have been developed, you know, sort of in order to create a point or to create precedent. And it wasn't actually supposed to end up that way, uh, with the result being in favor of affirmative, of, of affirmative action in that specific case, simply because this person was extremely qualified and was only rejected because of his race. So you see a backlash in that case now we fast forward today. That case that I talked about happened decades ago. Today, some branch of the government uh, decided that Yale has discriminated against white people and Asians uh, by essentially following a similar policy that was approved in this other court case that happened decades ago. So now you have this backlash. And remember, nothing has changed, right? The law, the constitution is still the same. Nothing has changed. You simply have a backlash and this happens all the time that keeps the two power, the two political powers in power. And so the example here would be as the laws get more and more inclusive, which then requires both exceptions to the existing simplicity that was the original foundation of the legal system that gave a lot of discretion to people like judges that used to be respected members of society, not people that were elected based on union connections or political appointments based on an, uh, on, a, on an insular system. And it, it is an insular system. If you go to the Supreme Court, you are very unusual to become a clerk that writes the opinions, or at least the first draft of the opinions that control national legal structure, uh, unless you went to one of, I believe, eight, eight or nine schools called the Ivy League schools. And so, Every four years, these, these attempts at more inclusiveness fail. The other example would be the conservatives then come in, we'll call them conservatives. Um, they come in and they say, look at, look at this, you know, look at all the rules that a small business has to comply with now just to get something done. And they'll show you a telephone book that they have to comply with. And they say, listen, these guys over there are nuts. This shouldn't be this way. We're gonna go ahead and cut all of this and make it easier for you to have what the law intended, which was fairness and, ac and accessibility. And of course, they also get it wrong because they're not accounting for, once again, inequity, inequity within the banking system and therefore the political system. All they're doing is reacting to an excess by the other side. And so every four years or the next four years, 
we, we end up in the same spot. And then the other guys come back and say, listen, you know, these guys had their chance, maybe over four to eight years, and they may have even tried to pump a ton of money into the economy, trillions of dollars into the economy, and they still failed. We still have inequality. We still have supply and demand issues regarding labor and so on. And then the other, and then the liberals come in and it goes back and forth. This doesn't happen unless you have a political and legal system that was supposed to replace the corruption of the church in Europe and ended up in a similar situation as a problem that it was supposed to fix. Namely, consolidation of power in such a way that that maintains the status quo and that doesn't, that doesn't actually improve conditions for everyone. And what happens in that case is fragmentation. Fragmentation as more and more people lose faith 